The scripture says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 57, verse 14, which we read, God is giving us a command where he is saying, keep building, keep building. Then he tells us to clear the way, to remove everything he says blocking my people's path. That is to remove everything out of the way that causes his people not to return to him, not to come to him. To remove out of the way those things that make his people stumble, those things that cause for his people not to realize who he is and what he requires from them. To remove from their path those things that blind the people to the way that he has chosen for them to walk. He is asking you and I to remove those things out of the path of his people that still causes them not to realize who they are or to recognize who they are. He is telling you and I to be, to be busy about building and constructing a highway and then removing out of the people's way those things, all those things that causes his people not only to recognize who they are but the way that God would have for them to walk. Today in the world, there are so many voices telling the body of Messiah what they ought to do. So many voices out in the world today telling the people of God how they ought to walk and behave and to do. One denomination tells them this, another tells them this, one evangelist tells them this, one mega preacher on TV tells them this. Everybody is trying to tell the people of, of God which way they ought to walk. And every time they open their mouths, they are putting roadblocks in the way for the people of God to go. Every single time they open their mouths, they are digging holes in the pathway so that the people of God can't get around them, blocking their path. But the scripture tells us very plainly that there is only one way. There is only one truth, as there is only one God. There is only one path for the people of God to walk upon. I heard somebody once says that there are many, they say, they said this, yes, there is one path. But they said there are many entrance ramps <laughs> to get onto that path. Don't let nobody, don't, don't, don't believe that. There was one way to get onto that path. And that path leads to a specific destination. Yeshua himself says, concerning him being the good shepherd, and him being the door. He says that the thief and the robber, instead of coming up by that one path, he says they come up through many paths trying to get to that door. He calls them thieves and robbers. He calls them hirelings. But God is telling you and I, brothers and sisters, 
the path that he has laid with his life and his death, the path that he has laid by spilling his blood, he says, that is the path that we must all walk. And he is telling us to clear out the clutter, the obstacles, the hindrances that man has placed along that path that causes my people not to travel upon it, not to get where they ought to go. He is imploring you and I to clear out the mess. And that is what we are endeavoring to do by waking the people of God up as to who they are, their identity. And then awakening the people up so that they can understand that God has designed one way for them to walk. And it is that way of holiness that he himself has written the way that he, have gave, that he gave Moshe, then Moshe gave to the people of Israel, his people, God's people. The Torah tells us how we must live this life, and it tells us how we ought to walk daily. And if we walk the walk that God has proscribed, then our way will be pleasing unto our God. But if you walk the way that man has said, the apostolics say you must walk one way. The Baptists say you walk another way. <laughs> the Catholics say you can walk this way. The Lutherans say you can walk this way. Everybody has their way of walking, but I tell you, that is not God's way. God has already instructed us, told us the way that he wants us to walk. And if we do what God requires, then our life will be pleasing unto him. As Joshua said to the people of Israel as he was about to end his life, he says, Choose you this day whom you will serve. Will you walk according to the creeds and the dogmas and the doctrines of men as he espouses his religious doctrine? Or will you walk according to the way that God himself has outlined in his word? He tells us how to live among each other. He tells us how to treat one another. He tells us how to handle disputes between one another. He tells us when we ought to take our brothers and sisters to court to handle these disputes. He tells us how we ought to handle crimes and murders. He tells us how to eat. He tells us what to eat. He tells us how to worship, when to worship. He gives us holy days or holidays that he wants us to celebrate before him if we follow his ways. Then our lives will be pleasing unto him. But what has man done? Oh no. Man has created their own holidays to follow. Saying that and then, we, and then we throw Messiah in the midst of it and say, that makes it good. Keep building. Keep building. Clear the way, he says. Remove everything blocking my people's path. Today, brothers and sisters, is Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is one of the high holy days that Yahweh himself has designed for his people to observe. This holiday is on Yahweh's calendar. This holiday is not on 
man's calendar. For much of the body of Messiah does not observe this high holy day. Yahweh says you should. Man says you don't have to. And I pray that I hope at the end of the message that you can be like Joshua or that you can be like one of the, the prophets of old or Isaiah when he says, whose report will you believe? So for a short time today, I'm going to come with you with this title in Yom Kippur, the day of our atonement. In the book of Vayikra, the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, verses 26 through 32, it reads thus. Yahweh said to Moses, the tenth day of this seventh month, which is today, is Yom Kippur. He says, you are to have a holy convocation or a holy gathering or a holy meeting. And then he says, you are to deny yourselves and you are to bring an offering made by fire to Yahweh. He says, you are not to do any kind of work on that day because it is Yom Kippur to make atonement for you before Yahweh your God. Anyone who does not deny himself on that day, he says, is to be cut off from his people. And anyone who does any kind of work on that day, he says, I will destroy from among his people. He goes on to say that you are not to do any kind of work. He says, and this is the caveat, he says, it is a permanent regulation through all your generations, no matter where you live. He says that it will be a Shabbat of complete rest and you are to deny yourselves. You are to rest on your Shabbat from evening, the ninth day of the month, until the following evening. Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the Hebrew word that means day of atonement. On the tenth day of the seventh month, Yahweh chose this day specifically to deal with the sins of his people. That is, the people of Israel. It is the one day that God chose to forgive all the sins of his repentant nation. It is the one day out of all of the other 300 and some odd days it is the only day that he chose to deal with all the sins of the people. Now, throughout the year, thousands upon thousands of animals were sacrificed on behalf of the people. From the daily burnt and drink offering, which was offered two times a day, to the guilt sacrifice that was offered for the individual as well as the nation who, who, who inadvertently had sinned against Yahweh by violating the Torah command. In addition to these sacrifices were the peace, the vow, and the sin, of, sin sacrifices that were offered up on behalf of the people of Israel. Also, special Sacrifices were offered upon all the high holy days that Israel was commanded to celebrate before God. As I said before, thousands and thousands of animals were sacrificed on behalf of the people of Israel. But in spite of all of these daily offerings and sacrifices, Yahweh still require for one special day in which all the sins of the people were to be specifically dealt with, hence the day of Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur was not like any other day. It was different. It was special. It was set apart. 
on this day, the day of Yom Kippur, the scripture says that all the sins, not some, but all of the sins of the people, those committed, those sins committed intentionally and those sins committed unintentionally were to be atoned for. On many days, but especially on Yom Kippur, Yahweh was most gracious and merciful towards the repentant sinner. This was a special day set apart to deal with all sins, those committed knowingly and those committed unknowingly. Those sins that we've committed knowingly with the full knowledge of what we were doing but are now remorseful because of what we've done the day of Yom Kippur atones for these sins. Hear me now. Without Yom Kippur, there was no remedy for the repentant sinner who intentionally refused to comply with the Torah commandments. Without Yom Kippur, there was no solution for, no remedy for those people who intentionally committed sins and who are now remorseful. And those sins that they did on purpose. Do you see how important Yom Kippur is? Without Yom Kippur, if you willfully disobey God, if you willfully rebelled against the commandments of God, if you knowingly said, I'm going to disobey God, then there was no solution, no forgiveness of sin without Yom Kippur. Because throughout the scripture, if you read about the sacrifices, the sacrifices, the animal sacrifices, were only offered for those who inattentionally or unintentionally or who by mistake or not knowingly committed sins or violated God's commandments. That's what these animal sacrifices were for. If you made a mistake and didn't realize that you screwed up or messed up. But if you sinned willfully, knowing full well what the scripture says, there was no solution for your sin. Apart from Yom Kippur, Throughout the year, there was no sacrifice, no remedy, no forgiveness for intentional sins. None. And that's why Yom Kippur is so very important. Because on this one day, out of the whole year, the scripture says that all sins, those committed intentionally and unintentionally, for those who are truly sorrowful, will be forgiven. Now, by designing a system to operate in this manner, Yahweh was stressing to the people of Israel and to those who will later come to trust in him that deliberate disobedience to him would not be tolerated. This is what he is saying. I, he says, I will not give you a sacrifice that will remove your sin if you willfully disobey me. Through this method, he was trying to teach us, trying to teach the people of Israel that he would not tolerate deliberate disobedience to him. 
God doesn't change, brothers and sisters. Refusal to abide by the commandments of the Torah, which is sin, without true repentance is rebellion and is against the will of God. The scripture says it is as though it is as witchcraft to him. When we deliberately, willfully, knowingly disobey God, he considers it to be rebellion. And by Yahweh not providing a sacrifice for this type of sin throughout the year, he was making a blanket statement of what he required out of his children. He was telling you and I that we must live a life of obedience. Not sometimes, not six days out of the week, not 23 hours and 59 seconds of the day, but 24 hours of every single day. God is telling you and I, we must live a life in compliance and in obedience to his will. That we must live a life of complete holiness. That is, a life of holiness is a life without deliberately committing sin. That's what holiness is. Holiness is not saying that, you know, you don't make mistakes. Oh, we make mistakes. God has a remedy for that. But holiness is not willfully disobeying him because there is no solution for that. Now as God required this from our forefathers, he still requires this of us, his people, today. Over and over again throughout the Tanakh or the Old Testament, as the people say, or the Renewed Covenant or the New Testament, Yahweh instructs his people to live a holy life. For he says, not only in the first covenant, in the book of Leviticus, but he also says, also in the book of 1 Peter, he says, be holy. For I am holy. In other words, what he required from our forefathers, from our ancestors, back during the time when the Torah came down from the mountain, is the same standard of holiness that he is requiring from us today. It hasn't changed. Has holiness changed? Has God changed of what he considered to be holy or not? Holiness. This is what Yom Kippur is all about. It is about being made clean and then living a life of holiness from that day forward. For the scripture says this about Yom Kippur, listen. In the book of Leviticus, or the book of Vayikra, chapter 16, verse 30, it says this. For on this day, atonement will be made for you to purify you. You will be clean before Yahweh. Now watch this. From all your sins. It is the Torah, through the observance of Yom Kippur, that teaches that repentance and the forgiveness of sins is what Yahweh requires that makes a person righteous. Yom Kippur was all about purifying you, purifying and cleaning up the people of Israel. It is about the forgiveness of sins. It is about 
seeking and obtaining repentance by God. And after we have been made righteous, it is our manner of living afterwards that determines whether we will have maintained that level of holiness or not. Yom Kippur was to clean us up and make us clean, set our feet on solid ground, and then afterwards we were began, we was to walk this thing out, live this life of holiness every single day. The exact same thing, brothers and sisters, that Yeshua came to do. Clean us up, purify us, remove all of our sins, and then afterwards, because we're now clean, we can begin to live this life of holiness as God had required. It is through the symbol of that sacrifice on Yom Kippur, the scapegoat and the other goat for sin, it symbolizes Messiah Yeshua. It is through that symbol, that sacrifice, that would accomplish the task of removing our intentional sins. Do you understand? Yom Kippur was all about removing sins, both those sins that we committed inadvertently, unknowingly, by mistake. But it was also designed to remove those sins that we committed against God intentionally, on purpose, deliberately. For those who are now sorry for what they've done, just like Yeshua. For every aspect, hear me now, of Yom Kippur, from the high priest to the sacrifices offered for sin, everything point to Yeshua for its ultimate fulfillment. Why do we celebrate Yom Kippur? Because it tells the story of Yeshua. It tells us, it reminds us of what he did for us. It reminds us of what he did for those who will come to believe in him. But it also tells us of what he, want, what he will do in the future as well. So that's why it is so important for us to continue to observe Yom Kippur because it tells a story. Now on one day out of the whole year on Yom Kippur, the people who were truly repentant found forgiveness for their sin. For those who weren't repentant. And for those who could care less about what Yahweh wanted, and there were a few of them, curses and death awaited them. Oh, yeah. You see, there was no solution, no remedy for their sins. They weren't repentant. They didn't care. They disobey God and they enjoy doing it. There was nothing God could do for them. And many of them, as, as, as according to the scripture says, many of them died without mercy because they weren't seeking mercy. They wanted to do their own thing. Remember the description says, God is merciful to those who are what? Merciful. They didn't care. They are out fooling around, sleeping around, worshiping other gods because they wanted to. But to those who, 
As I said before, those who weren't repentant, those who were not seeking God to forgive them, only curses and death awaited them. It was the just punishment for their behavior. But for those who, after being forgiven on Yom Kippur, who would then turn around and deliberately sin by disobeying the commandments. Hear me now. For them, there was no sacrifice for the deliberate sin. Once God forgave them on Yom Kippur, and then they turned around and then disobeyed him, there was no sacrifice for them. Now, if afterwards they would repent, then they would have to wait until the day of Yom Kippur to receive atonement. They would have to wait a whole year because there was no sacrifice for them. Now, watch this. Because Yeshua's sacrifice is the fulfillment of Yom Kippur, his death, like the scapegoat, removed our unintentional sins as well as our intentional sins. For those individuals who aren't repentant and those who could care less to give their lives to Yahweh, death and curses await them. That is the unsaved. They can care less. For those individuals, oh, excuse me, it is the just punishment for their behavior. For those who choose not to follow God, not to give their lives to Yeshua so that they can be in line with God, live your life the way you want, baby. But know at the end of the day, what is awaiting you? Death. It is their just punishment for their behavior. But for those who are truly repentant and would receive forgiveness through Yeshua, and he forgives them, and they then turn around and deliberately sin by disobeying the commandments of God. For them, like those under the animal sacrificial system, there is no sacrifice for their deliberate sin. None. And the scripture bears this out, for it says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, Verses 26 through 27, listen very carefully. It says this, For if we deliberately continue to sin after receiving the knowledge of the truth, it says there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying prospect of judgment of raging fire that will consume the enemies. Do you see, just like Yom Kippur, there is no sacrifice for deliberate sins or deliberately disobeying God. After you have come to the knowledge of the truth, after you have given your life to Yeshua, after you have asked him to come into your life, into your heart, and applied his blood to the doorpost of your souls, and he has removed your sins. If afterwards, if you tasted the goodness of heaven, and if afterwards you have now deliberately sinned, turned your back on the commandment, knowingly knows what the scripture says, and you say, I don't care, I'm going to do what I want to do. The scripture says in the book of Hebrews, there is no sacrifice for deliberate sins. Just like Yom Kippur. 
just like it was in the Old Testament during the sacrificial system. God did not provide a remedy apart from Yom Kippur for intentional sin. Same way in the New Testament. God does not provide a sacrifice for deliberate sins apart from Yeshua. Once you have accepted him, tasted him, given your life to him, and then you turn around and go back out and do whatever you want to do, disobeying the commandments, there is no sacrifice. Do you see? It's the same. It is no different. What God required then, he requires now. The principle of forgiveness of sins established in the Torah through the observance of Yom Kippur is present in the sacrifice of Messiah Yeshua or is present in the New Testament. It hasn't changed. If we, after having given our lives to Yahweh through faith in Yeshua, continue to deliberately sin, there is no sacrifice that can cleanse us. None. You see, once you've committed to this way, brothers and sisters, you must live a life of holiness. Today and forever. It, it, it is not like I can do it six days out of the week or or I can live for God just on, 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 on the Sabbath. And then the other six days of the week, I can live like a hell. You can do what I want, say what I want, participate in what I want, eat what I want. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> the only thing that awaits those who continue to deliberately sin after coming to the knowledge of the truth, the scripture says, the only thing that awaits them is the terror of judgment. And then after that judgment, then the lake of fire. He says, God will judge you at the great white throne judgment. Found in the book of Revelation chapter 20. And then he says, and then after that judgment, then the lake of fire for those who continue to deliberately sin. You see why Yom Kippur is so important? <laughs> it reminds us. It reminds us of what Yeshua did, and it reminds us to live the life of holiness. Now, the question that believers then ask is, when Yeshua died for our sins, didn't he fulfill scripture by becoming the scapegoat? And if this is so, why then must we observe Yom Kippur? Apart from what I said earlier, the answer to this question can be answered by simply stating that what the scripture commands us to do. For it states, again, as I read in the book of Leviticus, or Vayikra, chapter 23, verse 27, verse 29, and verse 31. For it says, the tenth day of this seventh month is Yom Kippur. You are to have a holy convocation or, or a holy meeting or a holy gathering. You are to deny yourselves. For those who choose not to gather on your, on these high holy days, I believe God is speaking to you because you've made a mistake. The, the scripture tells us to gather. The scripture tells us to come together. The scripture tells us to be one in one place. He goes on to say that anyone who does not deny himself or fast on this day is to be cut off from his people. That means you're on the outside of the people of Israel looking through the window. And it goes on to say this, he says, you are not to do any kind of work 
and it says it is a permanent regulation throughout all of your generations, no matter where you live. Why must we celebrate Yom Kippur as believers in Messiah? Because the scripture tells us we must, tells us to gather, tells us to fast, tells us not to work. And then it tells us, more importantly, that it is to be observed in every generation known to mankind. For every believer, both Jew and Gentile, who serves Yahweh through his son Yeshua, are first of all required to observe this day of atonement. There is nothing in Scripture that states that we are not required to observe this day. You won't find one scripture that says you no longer have to obey or to observe the high holy days. For even Rav Shaul or the Apostle Paul himself said in the second chapter of the book of Colossians that these days are a shadow of things to come. That means they have not been fulfilled. And if they haven't been fulfilled, then that means they are still required to be obeyed and to be observed. For those who say that Yeshua fulfilled the Torah and they no longer have to do it, these feasts, according to the scripture, are a shadow of things to come that they must happen in the future. That means they haven't happened. That means they haven't been fulfilled. And then that means you must obey them. Observe them. As I said before, there is nothing in Scripture that says that we as the body of Messiah are not required to observe this day. But on the contrary, the scripture says that it is a permanent regulation throughout all of our generations. Everyone, every generation. It is a permanent, permanent regulation throughout all of our generations. All of our generations. That includes the time of Yeshua before and after his death and resurrection, even until this present day, God, God gave this command knowing full well that Messiah was coming. And he stated it anyway throughout all of your generations. This day, Yom Kippur, is to be observed by all of his people. Now, if you're not his people, baby, then don't observe it. Don't keep it. Do what you want to do. As the song says, I can tell you how to sock it too. It's your thing, baby. Do what you want to do. Do what you want to do. If you don't belong to the Messiah, do what you want to do. But if you belong to Messiah, if you are the people of the living God, then you are required by the command of God through Scripture to observe this day of Yom Kippur, for it is a permanent regulation throughout all of our generations. This includes the time of Yeshua, as I said, before and after his death and resurrection unto this present day. All the people of God must observe this day yearly. In addition to this, the Scripture states that we must deny or afflict ourselves through fasting and that everyone needs to confess their sins and repent in order to be forgiven. The believer may then insist by saying, Yeshua paid it all. Why must we then afflict ourselves on Yom Kippur or why must we fast on Yom Kippur? 
Besides what I stated before, that this holiday is supposed to be observed through all of our generations and that it speaks to us about what Messiah did. My response to them would be this, why you must afflict yourselves and why you must repent. For 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 through 10 says, If we claim not to have sin, we are deceiving ourselves. This is John talking to believers of this particular congregation that he is writing to. He is saying that if we claim not to have sins, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. He says, if we acknowledge our sins, then since we, he is trustworthy and just, he will forgive them and purify us from all wrongdoing, just like Yom Kippur. He says, if we claim we have not been sinning, we are making him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Through observing Yom Kippur, we admit that we sin sometimes unintentionally. And because we do, then we must purify ourselves. Can any one of us say that we don't sin unintentionally? Can any one of us say that we don't make mistakes? then if you do, then Yom Kippur is for you. <laughs> we sometimes make mistakes and don't always do the right thing or say the right things. There are times when we don't always treat each other the way Yahweh would have us treat one another. In other words, we sometimes sin and we need to repent. The entire thrust of Yom Kippur is to affect change in the life of the believer so that we can purify ourselves and remain righteous. Fasting magnifies the seriousness of the day or the seriousness of the day. Fasting magnifies a call to repentance. Fasting magnifies the, the desire to be pure. Fasting is the mechanism that causes the believer to humble himself by putting down his flesh with his pride and his self-will, prompting him to want to ascend to a higher level of spiritual maturity and purity. Why must you fast? The, the, that is not the question. The question should be, why shouldn't you fast? If fasting does all of these things, and God knows what it does. He is asking you to come meet him on a higher plane. On this special day, where he is saying, I will forgive you of your sins. He says, come up to me, baby. Be holy like me, ascend to the heights of heaven. Fasting takes us to that higher level. Yom Kippur is therefore designed by God to remind the believer to repent from sins and to purify himself from all his uncleanliness. As we stated before, we must be holy because Yahweh our God is holy. Some say that Yom Kippur, brothers and sisters, is the best time to repent because it is, only, because it is the only day that Hasatan cannot hinder us, they say. Now understand that the, nu the, the numerical value of the letters Satan adds up to 364. Being that there are 365 days in the solar year, Hasatan, as his name represents, has power over 364 of those days against the people of God. However, there is one day in the year that Hasatan is 
powerless against us. And that is the day of Yom Kippur. This day commemorates Yeshua's entering into the holiest place in the tabernacle of God in the heavens to offer up before Yahweh once and for all his blood for the sins of the world. It is on that day that Satan couldn't do anything about it. Remember, when Yeshua walked the earth, Hasatan did everything he could to stop Yeshua. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he did everything he could to stop Yeshua. When he hung on the tree and stretched wide, hands pierced, feet pierced, Hasatan was there doing everything he could to get Yeshua to come down from the tree. But on that day when Yeshua ascended to heaven to offer his blood in Yahweh's holy temple, Satan was nowhere to be found. That day represents Yom Kippur, the only day, as tradition says, where Satan is powerless to do anything to the people of God. Also, Yom Kippur teaches us to fear Yahweh. In my closing, Yom Kippur is a time when we all need to be in great fear of Yahweh, the God of all creation. The scripture says that our God is a consuming fire and that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Yom Kippur teaches us to fear Yahweh, not just respect him, baby. No, no, no. No, no, no. Yes, God wants us to respect him, but God also wants us to fear him as well. Do you understand, when the people of Israel went to Mount Sinai and stood before Yahweh, be, before the mountain, there was a reason why Yahweh put the mountain on fire to illustrate that he is a consuming fire. There is a reason why that there was thick blackness on the top of the mountain. There is a reason why there was an earthquake and the earth shook. There is a reason why there was lightning coming down from the sky. Yahweh wanted the people of Israel to be afraid. He wanted them to fear for their lives. Oh, yes, it's good for you and I to have respect of Yahweh. But he wants us to fear him. If there is a person who is a believer and says that they don't fear Yahweh, hear me now, they are not a true believer. Even as parents, or even as children who have parents, we love our daddy, we love him to death, but we fear our daddy too. I was growing up, I was scared of my dad because he had power to discipline. He had power to cause and to inflict pain on me, a disobedient son. Oh, I love my dad. He would come by and tap me on the head and I would just be, oh my goodness, my dad touched me. I thought that was the greatest thing from this side of the moon to the next. But when my dad's anger kindled, <laughs> us children were, were like mice or, 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 or like roaches. When you cut the light on, we all scurried. We all ran, jumping under beds, jumping behind couches. <laughs> when the fury of our daddy kindled, we were afraid. And God wants us, his children, not only to love him, not only to respect him, but he wants us to fear him as well. Understand this. Through Yom Kippur, we reestablish 
the fear of Yahweh on this day by realizing that fear of Yahweh keeps us from sinning against him. Just like our own daddy, if we're afraid that he's going to get us, then more than likely we, we won't disobey him. Fear of Yahweh keeps us from sinning against him. For it would be on this day, the day of judgment, that Yom Kippur also represents that the books of life or the book of life is closed to those judged unworthy to enter, enter into life and the gates of life are therefore also shut to the unrepentant sinner. Yom Kippur is a day out of all the rest of the days of the year that we should fear for our lives and depart from sin. For the scripture says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 16, verse 6, it says, By the fear of Yahweh, men depart from evil. And again, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 5, verse 22, it says, Should you not fear me? This is Yahweh speaking. Should you not fear me, declares Yahweh. Should you not tremble in my presence. The fear of Yahweh keeps men from committing evil. When we are afraid of Yahweh, fear of what he would do, fear of the judgment that is to come, it keeps us in line. Yes, we love him, and that's why we obey him. But when we, when sometimes we can get a little bit out of, out of hand, and if we can remember who Yahweh is, this also will keep us in line. Yom Kippur reminds us of this as well. Let us greatly fear Yahweh our God, obey the Torah, and let us remember the awesome sacrifice that King Yeshua paid on our behalf, which this day represents. Let us honor and let us observe the day of Yom Kippur and all that this day means.